Um, so these are the various statements that I think you've already seen. It was cycling through on uh, CME activities, and I will come back to this in a moment. These are the objectives, which you already have seen if you've been on, and my confidentiality pledge, which uh, I have given prior to this uh, with my hand raised. So um, this is the title of my talk is Developing Different Devices for Drug Disorders, uh, trying to be alliterative. Uh, and um, as far as my disclosures go, as I mentioned, we received bridge devices, which I'll be talking about from the manufacturer, uh, Massimo, for use in an NIH-funded study. And I have consulted for paratherapeutics, who provide support for a clinical trial being conducted uh, at the BPRU, which I will also uh, touch upon uh, later in this talk. Um, so my outline for today, uh, I'm going to talk about devices and how they're regulated, uh, and then some history of device use in the area of substance use disorders. Uh, we'll talk about three examples of devices that we're studying here uh, at the BPRU, and then I'll touch briefly on other devices in development and give a couple of final thoughts and uh, hopefully wrap this up. Um, so... Uh, what are devices and how are they regulated? And I got particularly interested in this topic a few years ago when uh, the HEAL initiative was being uh, promulgated, the NIH's effort to address uh, opiate use and opiate overdose deaths. Um, the FDA Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, the CDRH, which I really wasn't familiar with, uh, convened a very small meeting. I think it was probably about 15 or 20 of us down in the DC area in 2018 to see how could they help? How could devices help with opiate use? And out of that meeting uh, came this JAMA Psychiatry Viewpoint paper, uh, Sandy Comer, who has participated, and Bob Dworkin from uh, Rochester and myself wrote on medical devices to prevent opiate use disorder innovative approaches to addressing the opioid crisis. And this, this really got my juice to sort of, I had been thinking about devices, but it, it really helped me to uh, think more about them and what are devices. So just what is a device when we talk about a device? Well, probably most of us would say, that's a device, that's a portable x-ray machine. And we'd all probably say, yeah, that's a device. And there's a boot and that sure looks like a device. Uh, so we'd probably say, yeah, that's a device. And there's a EKG machine. And again, we would say, yeah, that's a device. And there's a, uh, um, an ECT machine. And in psychiatry, we'd say, okay, yeah, yeah, well, okay, we've got that as a device. And then in drug abuse, this is a drug testing screen. Um, and we'd probably say, okay, yeah, that's a device, I suppose. And then We've got things like tongue depressors. Is that a device? We use those in medicine. Is that a device? Well, the FDA, of course, has defined a device. And a device is an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article, including a component part or accessory that is intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions, or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, or intended to affect the structure of any function of the body, and does not achieve its primary intended purposes through chemical action within or on the body. Now, I've just got to say, you know, uh, we're familiar with the idea of disjunctive and conjunctive categories. The use of the word or, I think, appears nine times in this, if, if I recall correctly, you know, so it's it's a testimony to um, you know disjunctive categorization, which which suggests that you know we've got an intuitive sense of what a device is, even if we can't necessarily define it. But what I would say is the important thing is it does not achieve its primary intended purposes through chemical action within or on the body, which is what a drug does basically. So in my simplistic mind, what is a device? I would say a device is things we use in medicine minus drugs equals devices. So if it's not a drug and we use it in medicine in some way, some apparatus or thing, then we probably think of it as a device or we should think of it as a device. 
So this can, let me know, can get complicated, right? So there are drugs that we can swallow in a novel delivery system. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but there's like smart drugs that are being developed that are in capsules that can be released in different ways or uh, have a lower abuse liability uh, because of the design of those capsules. Um, but we're not going to go there today uh, in, that, in that interface between device and drug. Uh, for the most part, we're just going to kind of put that aside. So, so relevant to this, and you'll you'll see how this gets especially relevant as we start to talk about some of these devices, is that the FDA has three classes for devices, and those classes vary by risk. Class one are low risk things, and these are things like toothbrushes and tongue depressors. So your toothbrush is a medical device. Now, that doesn't mean that if you want to make, or a tongue depressor, that doesn't mean if you want to start making tongue depressors that you've got to do, do a double blind controlled trial comparing your tongue depressors to other tongue depressors and show that they both are equally effective at depressing the tongue, thankfully. Um, you just need to show equivalence to a marketed product. And this can even be just simply FDA registered or FDA listed. So you can notify the FDA that you're going to put in a tongue depressor that's just like the other tongue depressors and, and move forward with that or a toothbrush or, or other similar class one devices. Class two devices have moderate to higher risk. And examples of these are things like catheters and syringes. The majority of devices, close to 50% of devices marketed are class two devices. Class three devices have high risk. Examples of those are things like stents and implantable pumps. So they typically require clinical trials to approve, similar to uh, the drug approval process. So you, you're gonna have to do a study with a control condition and things like that if you're developing a new stent, for example, to use in cardiac surgery. Now, another point about this is that the FDA approval to market a device differs from approval to market a drug. And this is a critical point that sort of took me, took me aback when I realized this, um, but it does sort of make sense. So for a drug, you need to show substantial evidence of safety and efficacy. While for a device, you need to show reasonable evidence of safety and efficacy. And there's this, this balancing act, because if you start to think about it, for some devices, if, and we'll come back to this with an example, but if you show that it's safe and maybe it's effective, the FDA will say, well, okay, you know, as long as it's not going to hurt the person and there's maybe some evidence of efficacy, we're probably going to let that go forward. So FDA approved, the benefits outweigh the risks, and that's used for drugs in class three devices. FDA cleared, on the other hand, is typically used for class one and class two devices that are substantially equivalent to another marketed product already cleared or approved. So you'll see this terminology used of FDA cleared as a, as a, or some equivalent term to that, as opposed to FDA approved when you start to get into devices. So finally, and this is a little bit of maybe inside baseball, but you may hear of the 510K process which is how a device gets cleared. It's the demonstration of a comparable efficacy and safety to an existing marketed product. So if you're talking to a company, for example, they may talk about the 510K process and all they need to do is um, fulfill the 510K process. And this is a process that's not just for devices, but also for, for drugs, where if you're, for example, coming up with a, a generic, then if, so long as you can show that generic has similar bioequivalency and things like that, then you can get approval without necessarily showing uh, 
uh, starting from scratch on efficacy and safety. So the take home points I wanna make on FDA and devices is that the approval process for devices is not the same as that for drugs. And we'll see that device manufacturers will say their product is cleared or authorized, but not necessarily say it is approved. I think, as I've thought about this, I think, and, and I could well be wrong, but I think this audience today and most psychiatric audiences, we mostly use drugs. So we tend to be less familiar with the device process. And we may be, um, how can I say this? We may be a little bit misled in our own thinking processes because we'll hear of a device that is cleared and we'll think it's approved, that it's gone through the same process as drugs or as a, um, um, a device like a, a stent. So here, we're gonna come back and talk more about reset O, but uh, just to, to pull this out, here's from the website for reset O, which is a device technically, and they refer to it as the only FDA authorized product. So it's an example of that where we may say, oh, it's FDA approved, or a patient may say, well, is it FDA approved? And we may say, oh yeah, it's FDA approved, I saw that, but it's not approved, it's authorized. So with that background, I next want to talk about some history of device use in the area of substance use disorders in particular, and uh, um, some give you some examples of, of devices that, that have been used. So um, we've, had, we've been using devices for years in substance use disorder treatment and, uh, and in research as well, of course. Um, so, uh, an example of something that we've used uh, is urine testing. I just showed this. So we've had on-site testing machines and urine test strips. Um, we used, um, uh, when I first started at the BPRU as a postdoc years ago, we did on-site emit testing with a machine here. Um, and these have been around for literally decades. Um, similarly, uh, Often we use breath alcohol devices. This is an example of one. We use this in our research. We've got a number of these. Um, if people are coming in to sign consent for an alcohol study, we'll require them to blow a zero on their breath alcohol level. Um, these are also used often in uh, places like opioid treatment programs or methadone clinics where we ask people to blow if there's concern about whether they might have alcohol on their breath to make sure that they're not impaired. Um, so these are often used in outpatient settings. And then, um, and I'll show you an example in the next slide, but methadone dispensing systems, we got interested in these uh, at the BPRU probably 30 or more years ago where we started developing our own internal systems um, I think even before uh, they hit the market. Uh, so um, when I first started in the, the dark ages, as, as Jimmy alluded to, in the uh, late 80s, methadone would be hand pumped. And many, most clinics used hand pumps where there was a device put on top of a bottle and uh, a nurse would pump and the device would uh, dispense a certain amount of methadone. And of course, if there were air bubbles or if there were problems, where the nurse didn't pull the pump correctly, it was hand done. Um, there could be problems with the amount of methadone that was given. It was, uh, and then it would have to be hand recorded how much methadone had been dispensed. And it was a rather laborious process. And, and we got interested in, you know, is there, was, would there be a way to develop um, a machine to pump methadone? Uh, and actually our technical director at the time, who was a real sort of, um, clever fellow John Yingling um, had bought a pump, a few pumps and started playing with them and created one. And then uh, these started coming on the market. And this is one now that's on the market. Um, so this is actually uh, something you can buy from a methadone program. It's a, it's a pump. You can see here, this is a bottle of methadone. And then there's a, a tube that goes into the pump and then it pumps out methadone which is dispensed in a liquid form typically at a methadone clinic, and it's dispensed into a, a cup. 
uh, which the person then drinks. Um, or it can be dispensed into a bottle that's capped and then given as a take-home dose. I'll talk about take-home doses more in a bit. So uh, these have really moved forward now. Um, and uh, as far as devices and substance use disorder research, I'm not going to go into a lot of this because these aren't necessarily approved, but I thought I would just mention, um, you know, we've used for years, this on the left um, is uh, what we would call a circular lights box, um, which we use to test uh, performance effects of drugs. Uh, it's very sensitive to, to acute effects of, for example, benzodiazepines. Uh, the way this works, this box is about three foot by three foot in size. It's mounted on a wall and there are, I've lost my cursor, but it's hard to see, but there are little lights, pinpoint lights around this. And then there's one in the center. There's actually lights in this one along the axes. The person puts their thumb on the center light and then randomly other lights turn on and the person goes out to press those lights with the center one in between. And so it's a, a test of performance. It's actually marketed as a, uh, a test of uh, saccade eye movements, um, but it's been used in substance abuse research. Um, and then on the right here, this is a, a pupillometer. It's marketed by uh, Neuroptics. Uh, this is a uh, taste. You can actually see here um, the, the eye. This is held up against the eye. It's kind of sort of a, a, a rubber, um, uh, membrane that goes around the eye and takes a picture of the eye as, as probably you know, the people in the eye can be very sensitive to acute drug effects, especially of opioids and stimulants. This device actually uh, takes pictures that can also include things like the, the, uh, the rate at which the eye contracts or expands in response to a, a light stimulus. Um, this device is very cleverly marketed uh, I think it still costs $4,900. So it actually can be ordered on grant applications as supplies, uh, grant applications. If it's over $5,000, it becomes equipment. So this is considered a supply item. Um, it is rather expensive though at $4,900. We use these routinely in our studies. So these devices have been used, uh, been in use for years decades uh, with some changes, especially refinement of the methadone dispensers and linking them to computers, as you can imagine. So now there are dispensers that can be linked to so that you can pull up on a computer a patient's name, and then click a button and the methadone can be dispensed. Uh, and then there's a record of the total amount of methadone that's been dispensed over some period of time. But I would say overall, there's been really limited or little innovation for many years in the substance use disorder treatment arena. Um, and it tended to be changes in other areas of medicine that were picked up by the substance abuse treatment field. So really, I think the methadone dispensing systems, for example, were, you know, pumps that were, were made for other purposes in medicine. And then, you know, somebody like John Yingling, the technical director said, hey, you know, we could take this and modify it and start to see if we could use it in uh, a clinic setting. Um, that has changed. Now, I also want to acknowledge here the use of computers in treatment. Telehealth uh, certainly is taken off in substance use disorder care. I'm not really going to address that today. A lot of people have talked about that at Grand Rounds. Uh, obviously, that's been a, an extremely impactful uh, aspect of care. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that there have been efforts with this well before COVID. Um, so I can remember, gosh, probably uh, 20 years ago, um, I think uh, I think it was Ken Stoller, uh, but I, I could be wrong. I think Ken was doing, uh, playing when he was working with ATS uh, here at Bayview with doing online group therapy uh, on computer uh, with some patients. Uh, there was some some early efforts and things like that. Um, so, uh, but it's obviously also taken off in a, in a really dramatic way here uh, in the last, what has it now been, two and a half years. Um, and I want to ignore, acknowledge uh, this, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. So this is a paper that was published in 2008 
by the late Kathy Carroll, who uh, uh, passed away tragically in her early 60s, just a couple of years ago, a really great, great person at Yale, um, who uh, was a real leader in the field. And Kathy had this uh, program that she had developed called Computer Assisted Delivery of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, um, which she called CBT for CBT. Uh, so computer-based treatment for cognitive behavioral therapy, or I never knew if it was cognitive behavioral therapy for a computer-based treatment. But regardless, uh, she had been playing with this back um, now 15 years ago, nearly 15 years ago, uh, and published a paper on that. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, I think there's been relatively little innovation in device use for the field of substance abuse or disorder treatment for many years, um, although that's now starting to change. So uh, I'm gonna next turn to talking about three examples of devices being studied uh, that we're studying here at the BPRU and um, talk about these a little bit more. Uh, and um, hopefully some of the logics of why we've studied these or why we're studying these now um, makes sense within the context of my explanation of devices and how the FDA views them and, um, and the need for innovation in this area in substance use disorder treatment. So I'm gonna in particular talk about um, a product called Reset and Reset O, which I alluded to earlier. It's marketed by Pair Therapeutics. I'm gonna talk about electronic pillboxes, and then I'm gonna talk about something called the bridge device. Um, and so we'll start with reset and reset O. Now, reset um, is an interesting product. Reset is a prescription digital therapeutic. Um, so this is um, a digital therapeutic that you can enter an electronic order, assuming your electronic health record system has it listed, you can enter an order to prescribe this digital therapeutic to a patient. Um, Reset and Reset O have been um, approved for use by a number of uh, third-party payers. And issue for a while was um, that Medicaid in states did not approve its use. Um, I'm told by the company now that there are a number of states that have approved use of Reset and Reset O uh, for Medicaid populations. And I believe uh, California is one of those, which was a major step forward if that is the case, if it's finally gone through um, since as California goes, much of the rest of the country goes. Um, so we'll talk more about reset and reset over over O oh, over the next few slides. Um, but it is a prescription digital therapeutic. It is the first of these uh, to reach the market. Although I should note that there is another one called Dynamicare, uh, D Y N A C A R E, which is fairly far along in the process. Um, and uh, I have not. I have consulted for the people who make Reset and Reset Oh, I haven't for Dynamicare, but Dynamicare has funded some work here done at the BPRU by other people. Um, and it's a little bit of a tangent, but uh, there was an article in the Baltimore Sun I saw sometime in the last few days where they were talking about contingency management. And uh, I think they they may have alluded to Reset or Reset Oh and that. This is this product has been getting a lot of general press coverage. So it's a software app, uh, hopefully needless to say at this point. It is derived from something called the Therapeutic Education System or TES. Um, and I bring up TES uh, in part because I want to acknowledge um, this work by Alexis Hammond. Um, so Alexis, when she was a brachy fellow as a PGY-4, began a study on Meyer 5, uh, which was a randomized and controlled trial of what was called an internet-based therapy uh, 
for dual diagnosis patients. For this, so this was people with um, substance use disorders and another psychiatric disorder. Uh, and uh, co-authors were Dennis Antoine and Maxine Stutzer and myself. And this was using TEFs. So um, she actually uh, did this and it was looking at, would this be acceptable? TES had not been used in a dual diagnosis population before. And um, she uh, tested this in uh, nine, I think it was 95 patients who were randomly assigned either treatment as usual on the floor or treatment as usual plus TES. Uh, while they were there and they were able to do this uh, on the floor. So I want to give a shout out to Alexis uh, uh, for that project with TES. Now, RESET received FDA authorization, not approval, but authorization in 2018. I want to note that RESET has as a core feature to it, a contingency management component. Um, let me explain a little bit about this. Reset is very interesting in Reset O because essentially what they do is they do something like a prize bowl process with the contingency management. That is, if the person has not been using, um, they, are, they enter sort of a, um, a fish, it's called a fishbowl, if I said prize bowl, but fishbowl, or it's, it's something similar to that where they are randomly given either um, a response back, hey, that's great, you haven't used, or congratulations, you've earned a dollar, or congratulations, you've earned five dollars, or you can earn, I forget the maximum amount, it may be fifty dollars. The interesting aspect of, of this is, or uh, uh, an interesting caveat to this is, over the course of using Reset, you cannot earn more than six hundred dollars. And that number has been selected uh, for a very simple reason. If, if you earn $600 or more, then a 1099 needs to be um, registered with the IRS. So the company then gets into this whole quagmire of you know, getting social security numbers and all that sort of thing. The earnings up to $600, the, the patient has to, is, is supposed to report those as miscellaneous income, but there's not a responsibility on the part of the, the company to do that to issue a 1099. So, um, so, uh, but people can earn up to that amount of money. Now, reset has been found to be effective. So, this was a study conducted. Uh, this uh, paper was. Let me go ahead and add this. This is published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2014. This was a uh, CTN project, a clinical trials network project. So it's a multi-center study. They enrolled 507 patients in it. They were using at the time what was called TES. So patients were, uh, oh, they had mixed use. So people could have alcohol problems or cannabis problems or opiates or cocaine. Um, so, uh, and they were randomly assigned to either treatment as usual or treatment as usual plus TES. And they did uh, attempt to control for treatment time. So if people were getting assigned to the TES group, um, their treatment as usual was decreased so that roughly comparable amounts of treatment in total were given to the two groups. And basically what they found was that there was lower dropout and better abstinence. It was an outpatient study. Uh, with the addition of TES to um, the treatment as usual group. And that, on the basis of that, the company then rebranded TES as Reset and was able to get FDA approval for the product. Now, the company also, after it got Reset out, went for uh, a revised version of Reset that was specifically targeting opiate users. And that's where they came up with Reset O for opioids. Um, and the idea behind Reset O is it's for outpatient use along with buprenorphine treatment. That's the main goal. And I think this is because there's a recognition, um, maybe not an acceptance in the field, but there's a recognition in the field that a lot of patients receiving buprenorphine are not getting any other real services beyond a prescription for buprenorphine. And so 
is there a way to address that through a product like this? Um, and so they they came up with this reset O, a revised version of reset, um, which works for 84 days, 12 weeks of treatment. It's very much similar in terms of maximum earnings, a contingency management portion to it, as well as other didactics on opiate use and risk behaviors and triggers and targets and things like that. Again, it includes contingency management. And uh, studies showed there was increased retention and treatment and higher rates of abstinence with this product. So what, the, what they did, the company did, was they went back to that CTN project and did a subgroup analysis of opiate use disorder patients from the study who were on buprenorphine, specifically on buprenorphine. And what this is from a paper by Yuri Marichik, who's actually with Paratherapeutics, uh, that was just published uh, a couple of year, a year ago. Um, and uh, what you see is, here's the treatment as usual group. There were 79 of those from that project. And then there was treatment as usual plus TES, the digital therapeutic, 91. And what they showed was uh, that the digital therapeutic group, the TES group or reset O, did better on uh, abstinence from opiates and cocaine abstinence from opioids only, and abstinence even from cocaine only uh, for these patients. And there were a number of other uh, secondary outcomes as well um, that showed significantly better outcomes. So keep in mind now, because of this, because they got reset approved, they got reset O, and they could go back to the FDA without necessarily doing a whole new study and look to get approval for reset O, oh, not approval, uh, authorization or clearance from the FDA for this product. Um, I want to mention that Cecilia Bergeria here at the BPRU is now doing a uh, randomized controlled trial uh, testing the use of reset O oh in the Bayview Emergency Department um, with opiate users who are getting started on buprenorphine there. I, I want to acknowledge this was actually a project that Maggie. Uh, Sweeney, who's left the faculty, but uh, she had actually started the project. Cecilia kind of, kindly stepped in to pick it up and is doing it. It is sponsored by Paratherapeutics. Um, and we have here at Bayview, and I think at JHH as well, we've got a very uh, formalized protocol for opiate users who are coming in who are not in treatment to be started on sublingual buprenorphine in the emergency department and then uh, transition to outpatient providers quickly uh, as part of that. So there's a, a pretty well-established and relatively seamless way to manage the medication that the person has on. And so the idea here now is, could we improve that by adding folding in reset O to that process? So getting the person signed up for reset O in the ED and then continuing it on an outpatient basis, can we improve, for example, um, the retention rates on the outpatient side? Let me parenthetically mention, getting people on buprenorphine is not a problem these days, at least in the mid-Atlantic region. The problem is that people don't stay on buprenorphine, that dropout rates are, are high. And so this holds out a way to potentially improve that. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is electronic pillboxes. Um, is something that, that's been studied here. Um, so electronic pill boxes, these are really interesting products. They've been developed for other target patient populations, um, such as uh, homebound people, elderly people, uh, maybe people who uh, have uh, some cognitive slippage, um, but they're now being tested in, for the use of methadone and buprenorphine dispensing. These are really interesting products if you're not familiar with them. They allow uh, once a day dosing. The boxes are typically locked. So the only that day's dose will be available to the person. Um, some are Bluetooth enabled so that if somebody says, hey, my, my box didn't unlock, um, they can call a number as we'll come back to talk about. And uh, so a staff member can get on and look at the device and confirm that 
today's dose didn't unlock and maybe override that or give them a backup dose uh, in the box. And because they're Bluetooth enabled, there can also, some of them have things like you can send text reminders and you can track adherence as well. So is the person taking the dose, you know, uh, uh, at peculiar times that are worrisome, what's going on with that to go back to them and say, hey, you know, I noticed you took a dose at 11 p.m. yesterday and then you took another one at 8 a.m. today, what's going on? Can we talk about that? Um, I wanna make sure I understand what you're doing with it. Here's some uh, pictures of them, The um, these, so you get a sense of them. Uh, you know, they typically have 28 or 30 cells to them. This one on the left is the med, is an, a MedMinder box, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, based on a couple studies that have been done here. But here's another one and get a third, you know, uh, these wheels where they can see the, the drugs. And, and you can even, you know, um, in some cases, for example, set them up uh, so that if a person has multiple drugs a day, then maybe the, you set up a wheel uh, for just a week's worth of drugs or eight days of drugs with, you know, different cells at different times of the day uh, so that the 28 cells cover the week or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, they are theoretically tamper resistant or if they're tampered, then obviously that's recognized when the person brings it back. Um, I'm not going to talk much about these, but they're also the development of smart bottles and dispensers. This is one now, uh, e-pill, um, where you know there's a, a, a something that uh, tells when it was opened and things like that. I, I've got to say, I probably about every nine to twelve months get uh, an email message from a grad student at the uh, Cary Business School saying, "Hey, we." We're brainstorming we came up with an idea of a medication dispenser that's a smart bottle and can we talk to you about that um and uh you know um any really creative idea has probably come up with by somebody already and uh that certainly is the case here but still uh these are interesting products as well not as refined typically as the um as the other dispensers although there have been some discussions about can you create bills, pill bottles that'll dispense just one pill at a time or something like that? Um, so this was a paper uh, published in 2021. So this was a study actually done pre-COVID. Uh, Kelly Dunn got a grant to uh, look at using uh, a pill box dispenser. It was the MedMinder box with 25 methadone treated patients at um, ATS. Uh, a study that she did with Robert Bruner and Ken Stoller. This was a phase two trial. Basically, it was looking at, you know, would there be any issues with use of this? Um, one of the things that you need to do with methadone patients, if you move them over to a box, is you have to get them, transition them from liquid methadone, like you see with the pump, to methadone tablets. Uh, so that is one step that needs to occur before you can can use this, but this, there were no real issues uh, with it. And um, uh, it's a nice paper. And it was uh, a study and a grant that, as I said, preceded COVID, but really was perfect in terms of its timing because of COVID and the idea, well, can we start to use these devices uh, with people to decrease the need to come into clinic during COVID? So Michael Kidorf, uh, and others did a follow-up study during COVID because they transitioned these boxes over to using them during COVID. Uh, and, uh, uh, and because there was this issue of how to handle methadone take-home doses. And as I mentioned, COVID's an ideal time to use a locked pill box. So this is a paper um, that Michael published uh, just this year um, where they took 42 methadone treated patients and this, in this case now, as opposed to the Dunn paper, where those were people who were generally stable, these were either vulnerable to COVID or they had a risk of methadone mismanagement. And it was an 11-week study with Robert, Kelly, and Jessica Pierce. And uh, in general, methadone... So before I get into this, let me just say that in general, methadone take-home doses 
allow a patient to not need to attend a clinic six to seven days per week. I hope that's sort of known to people now, but just to, to clarify, in a typical clinic, um, especially when somebody starts, they would be coming to the clinic six to seven days a week. Um, so, uh, and they don't get take-home doses until they show some stability in their treatment. And pre-COVID, programs avoided take-home doses for vulnerable patients due to the risk of diversion or misuse. So in this study, um, they had three groups, they identified three groups. Um, they, they broke it, there were 42 patients. Some of them had current use, some had uh, medical or cognitive limitations, um, and uh, some had a risk of mismanagement or living with a person with active misuse of the substance. I'm not gonna get into the breakdown of the groups too much uh, for the sake of time, but overall they're focused on this group, the 42. What you see is that uh, before the pill boxes, they were getting about 11 take-homes per month. And after the pill boxes, they were getting 25.6 take-home doses a month, which is, you know, essentially they're getting um, almost a month's worth on average. Um, there were uh, there were no real there was really no evidence of tampering in the first study by Kelly Dunn, but in this one, there was suspected tampering, uh, but still not a lot. Uh, and there were five patients that had their boxes rescinded for more intensive treatment on site. So, and one of the things to think about is this decreased cost in terms of the clinic operations, but they did need to provide a support telephone line that was utilized for the use of the boxes. And so that does require somebody who can get online to, to check and do uh, uh, by Bluetooth uh, checking the box, for example. So the bottom line of these studies is that electronic, oops, I misspelled that, uh, pill boxes are acceptable to patients. They decrease burden of daily clinic visits while decreasing risk of diversion or misuse of the medication. There's the issue of cost. You can't buy the boxes. You rent them, they're about 40 bucks a month. So it's not, not a low cost. And you can see how you could use a box with reset O and move treatment out of a central location like a clinic and improve access for patients. Let me last talk about bridge devices. Um, these were cleared by the FDA for treatment of opiate withdrawal in late 2017. Interestingly, this was based on, a clinic, on clinical studies, but not a controlled trial. So the bridge device, the logic was that the external ear contains branches of cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, and 10. And studies showed that electrical stimulation of the external ear can have neuromodulatory effects in central brain regions. And the theory that these guys came up with was that stimulation of cranial nerves nine and 10 in particular could attenuate opiate withdrawal. And they had some preclinical support for this, the group that did this. So they came up with this device. This is the bridge device. These are, this is the device uh, with wires that go to these electrodes. It's kind of like, almost like an acupuncture. It's a little um, uh, pinprick that gets placed in three areas around the ear. I, uh, as part of the training, I had somebody put it on me. It's not particularly uncomfortable. Um, and uh, and you, then you wear it for four to five days. There's no real risks involved. It costs about 500 bucks. Um, so the to my knowledge, what I've been able to get out of the company is that it was approved based on 73 patients in an, in an uncontrolled trial who had placed, and these are their cow scores, which is the opiate withdrawal score, which went from 20 down to about seven and less than five within an hour after placement. Um, there were anecdotal reports that it worked. So when this device first came to my attention, the company reached out to me, they sent me videos of testimonials and of patients receiving the device patients who clearly were in opiate withdrawal and then were calm and comfortable over the course of the, the 30 to 45 minutes. It was, it was a kind of, I mean, it could have all been staged, but NIDA, they came to me because NIDA was interested in it, serving as a bridge to get patients on naltrexone and on the market. So we're currently conducting a sham controlled clinical trial. It's a residential study has been derailed by COVID, but I think it illustrates how a low risk 
product with potentially some efficacy can get FDA clearance. Um, and uh, stay tuned. I'm curious to see what comes of this. So let me just, uh, a couple more slides and we're done. Other devices in development, there's other online programs and apps, as I mentioned, Dynamic Air, for example, as a product. I could have spent some time talking about wearable devices for detection of alcohol use, in particular, the Scram bracelet. We got really interested in this. Uh, Kelly put in a grant a couple of times to try to look at it. This is a bracelet that's worn around the ankle that does real-time detection of alcohol. Um, one of us, uh, I won't say who, we got one to play with a few years back, wore it for a weekend, drank a beer as part of, we didn't charge the beer to a grant, but you know to see if the Scram bracelet could detect it. It did detect it. It detects alcohol uh, through a transdermal system. Um, it's kind of a big and bulky thing, um, but uh, NIAAA has been very interested in developing transdermal detection devices for alcohol use. There's also wearable sensors to detect an opiate overdose. The people who make Fitbit actually had reached out to me years, several years ago now, pre-COVID. They wondered about whether they could use Fitbits to detect people overdosing uh, through an algorithm, and we had some initial discussions with them. I think the issue there is how do you get people to wear a Fitbit to start with? Uh, it's not, you know, people risk of opiate overdoses aren't your typical uh, target population for using Fitbits, but it's but it's an interesting idea that's been played around with. As I've mentioned, there's online group treatments that can be a virtual. Uh, there's a lot more work on that, and uh, opioid sparing devices uh, have been discussed as well, especially with respect to pain treatment. Could those decrease sort of upstream the diversion and misuse of opioids uh, through other techniques to treat pain. Well, let me wrap it up. Um, as I've said before, we've not really addressed telehealth, which is of course a major area of growth and development when it comes to devices. Uh, I think there's a lot more that can be done there that we'll see there over the course of the next um, few years especially when it comes to group therapy um, and uh, non-synchronous uh, non group therapy treatments as well, which is an idea that's out there and being discussed. I think I've said this a few times, but just to stress the lower FDA bar on devices, especially um, more simple devices, opens up opportunity for companies to develop products, including Me Too versions. And uh, I think that... Um, there's gonna be a need to determine whether these devices really work, like the bridge device, which um, got uh, a bit of attention when it first came out. And we're seeing expanding area development on multiple fronts uh, for devices. Some devices may be cleared with limited evidence of efficacy, but no risk. That's So that's, I think, where bridge came in is, you know, the efficacy, there's maybe something there, but there's really no risk. Uh, so we need to be prepared to understand their role in treatment and patient requests for them. Um, and uh, these devices and combinations of their use, for example, pill boxes and reset O have the opportunity to open up greater flexibility and treatment options, which I think is a really uh, great thing. So let me stop there. I think I came in one minute over and I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Terrific, Eric, that, that, was, that was really interesting. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, you know, as you were starting to talk about the bridge device, I was thinking about acupuncture, and then you mentioned acupuncture. Is, is acupuncture a device, and is there much evidence for it, and is it being used much to treat opioid use disorder? Um, there was, uh, I don't know if there still is, there was an acupuncture program. I think that the jail was, the Baltimore City Jail was uh, sponsoring in some way. Um and uh, I think acupuncture or the, the needles would be considered a device. Um, and I confess, I don't know where they are in terms of that. Uh, you know, if you market acupuncture needles, um, I assume that you've, it's probably fairly easy to get them uh, approved now because they've been around. What I will say is there's been, I haven't looked at the acupuncture literature in a few years now. Um, I got really interested in it probably about 10 or 15 years ago. There was a large 
very well controlled study of acupuncture for alcoholism that was done uh, out of, I want to say Lincoln Hospital. Is that a hospital in New York? Um, sure. Well controlled study where, you know, they put the needles in other spots that were, you know, so you got um, the sensation of it uh, in the control condition and they showed no efficacy. Um, but anecdotal reports are that people continue to feel it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the bridge device logic is if you could get a device that withdraws a person off opioids without using an opioid, then at the end of the five days, you could give them naltrexone and not precipitate withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So there's the bridge, Okay, which I should have made a point. Thanks. Thanks. Costa says, great talk, Eric. Thank you. Are there any devices of note related to nicotine or cannabis? Um, nah, well, uh, the uh, nicotine patch, um, would that be, I don't know if patches are considered a device or a drug. Um, there's, you know, that would be the, the kind of that weird sort of interface of do we go down the device path or the drug path? Um, and I suspect that the FDA probably would say for nicotine replacement products, NRTs, nicotine replacement treatments, that those are drugs and they need to go through that process. There was um, a nicotine inhaler when NRTs were first coming out. I don't know if I used to have one around. I don't know if I still do. Um, it was a plastic thing that looked like a cigarette uh, um, and contained a cartridge. And I don't know if that, that was nicotine impregnated. Um, I don't know if that was considered a device or not. I suspect all those probably went through the drug process. I don't think there's any for cannabis that I'm aware of. Mm. Okay, thanks. Tim says, thanks, Eric. Great overview. The picture you showed of the bridge device showed it on the right ear. Are there left to right differences. Rodent studies have shown that central projections from left and right uh, differ with only the right projecting to reward areas. Wow. Uh, <laughs> let's take the next question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, you know, I confess, I don't know if they say preferentially to use the right ear. I'll have to go back. You know, this study is the study from you know where. Uh, <laughs> because the grant was funded just before COVID hit. We shut down, um, it's take, it took forever to get it back up. Um, so we had to kind of go through some, we brought somebody in to train people putting the device on from Pittsburgh. And then, so I'll, I'll have to ask about that. I don't think there's any data to support uh, left, right differences in terms of the ear, but I would be interested to know if they, they recommend to start with the right ear. Great question. Okay. Brandon Burkett says, has it been conceptualized how prescription of D treatment, I'm not sure what DTX means. Did I miss something? Prescription of DTX would be prescribed in the department. When if EHP or Medicaid starts to cover these programs, would the patient just go through the company portal or would we type reset O into Epic and that would start the process? I imagine it would at least record eligibility in our notes and assuming the patient has a smartphone. I think he means uh, he or her, or she means uh, digital treatment probably. Digital treatments. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if the department has considered this. I don't think Maryland Medicaid has approved reset or reset O yet. I could be wrong, but I, I don't believe that's the case. Um, you know, the, the issue with reset and reset O is that uh, it's going to cost generally more than six hundred dollars, um, because there's just six hundred dollars alone, in or up to six hundred that the the patient may earn in in, uh, in it. So, um, but I think in other states it is the case that the provider you know can type in reset just like you type in orders you know, lisinopril or Selexa or whatever, and it pops up as an option. Um, and then you uh, you can select it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sarah Kalika says, are the, asks, are the smart pill boxes commercially available? I can imagine they could be useful for patients with depression and self-harm behaviors that might benefit from certain meds we otherwise would be hesitant to prescribe in large quantities like nortriptyline. 
Yes, they are. So these are out on the market. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think actually um, the, the target population often is older patients who may need reminders or, you know, concerns about, you know, gee, did I take, did I take my six medicines this morning? I, you know, four hours later. And so if they're using bottles, they just open up the bottles and take their six meds again and they double up or something. But these are marketed. You know, the issue is the MedMinder box, um, I actually checked with Kelly last week. I think they got a deal at the time that it was about 40 bucks a month to rent. So MedMinder doesn't want to sell the boxes. They want to rent the boxes. And uh, obviously that, that can add up if you've got a clinic with, you know, 100 patients that you could use MedMinder boxes with. You're suddenly looking at considerable expense on a monthly basis to use these. Um, but for targeted populations, yeah. Okay, and last question from Monster Malik. How does the reset -O verify abstinence or is it just patient reported? Uh, there can be patient reported. There can also be uh, urine test results. I should have mentioned um, they're also playing with a reset AUD for alcohol use disorder and a reset, actually, I think it may be approved now for insomnia, uh, which uh, is based on um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. I think that one may be on the market, but the alcohol use disorder one, I think they are working to, they're, they're, they're talking about linking that to breath alcohol testing as well. But um, so uh, there's, uh, yeah, a number of, Approaches that are used. Mm, interesting point from Ken. He says MedMinder will rent for free if you use their pharmacy to fill the prescriptions. Yeah. <laughs> interesting. interesting. Yeah, I should have mentioned, I think Ken, I, I know Ken has used MedMinders at uh, the Broadway Center. Interesting um, business model. And another note the insomnia device is cleared and it's called Somice. Somice? Somiest. Somiest. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, no, this this. Well, if you, I, I know we're out of time, but if you think about these digital prescription therapeutics, you know the incremental cost, in some cases, is pretty small. You know, once you've got it, you know it's just basically the 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 payments that they go. Right. 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 Somarest. 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 Oh, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hey, great talk, thanks, Eric. Yeah, thanks. no, that was interesting, thought-provoking. Thanks, everybody, for being on. Have a good week.